This video is brought to you by Nano, creators of virtual reality tools for immersive molecular visualization and interaction. Follow the link in the video description to download Nano and explore molecules yourself. Let's talk about denaturation. Um, so what is denaturation or denaturation? It is the loss or destruction of a protein structure or native conformation, which basically um, turns into a loss of function as a result. Um, and a lot of the times, denaturation specifically refers to the destruction of secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure, and not necessarily primary structure because that holds together the peptide bond. So basically anything that ruins secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure um, is, is considered denaturation. Although if you have an enzyme called a protease, which is a proteolytic enzyme, it cuts up proteins, uh, you're going to destroy that protein. Okay, so um, you, if, if, you, if denaturation is defined simply as the loss or destruction of a protein structure and consequently its function, then you could include that as well, okay, depending on who you talk to. Okay. Um, so let's talk about some agents that can actually cause denaturation or, or denaturing agents. So the first one, acids or bases, um, or basically just changes in pH. And that's because variations in pH or hydrogen ion concentration can alter titratable groups, whether they're protonated or deprotonated and therefore can disrupt um, electrostatic interactions. Electrostatic interactions, which of course hold together tertiary uh, and, and quaternary structure, okay? So if you have, for example, an aspartate and a lysine that are next to each other at a pH of 7.4, the aspartate is deprotonated and negatively charged, the lysine is protonated and positively charged, there's an attraction between them, okay? These opposite charges attract they want to come closer together but let's just say let's kind of exaggerate the point here uh, we take the pH and we go from 7.4 to, to 1 so we make it really really acidic so we're adding a bunch of protons we're adding a bunch and if we're adding a bunch of protons to decrease that pH then um, we're going to protonate groups and so with a pH that low aspartate ends up getting protonated because of course lysine is already protonated and now the attraction that was there is no longer nearly as strong because at first you had a positive and a negative charge, opposite charges attract, but here you have a positive charge and something that's neutral. So this positively charged lysine is not nearly as attracted to this aspartate as it was before. Now that's just one example of one interaction. Here we have an aspartate and here we have a lysine. So this is negatively charged and this is positively charged. We have an electrostatic interaction right here in this area. They're specifically attracted to each other. And that attraction is holding this region of the protein together. So you can imagine that if a pH change occurs here that alters the interaction between these guys, that can disrupt the structure here locally. You can imagine that if this occurs on a greater scale for the, you know, with, with all, a bunch of different side chains in a protein, that protein structure can, can be se severely altered. And of course the function can be lost. Okay, so uh, this is why um, uh, acidosis um, and, and alkalosis are are important and and um, and dangerous, right? If the pH changes in our in our um, in our body, different regions, of course, have different pHs. For instance, our blood is around seven point four. The pH in our stomach is around one or two. Um, those. There are optimal pHs given the circumstances, and if those pHs change too much, that can that can uh, denature the proteins that are in that area or in the in that region, and that of course is bad, okay, and dangerous. Okay, so next up, um, detergents. Detergents are amphipathic or amphiphilic molecules, which basically means that they have polar and nonpolar portions. Um, they are amphipathic or amphiphilic molecules that can orient their hydrophobic portions to associate with the hydrophobic portions or side chains of amino acids in a protein, therefore disrupting hydrophobic interactions. Okay, and then essentially they'll rip apart a protein. So this is um, tertiary or quaternary structure because um, hydrophobic interactions um, hold together tertiary and quaternary structure. Um, some detergents have charged portions. They're not just polar or nonpolar. They're actually charged, and and if that's the case, they can act. They can actually 
even though to a probably a much smaller extent, they can disrupt electrostatic interactions, but not all detergents are like that. So here, uh, SDS or sodium do, do, de, do decil or do diesel sulfate or do, this means 12. Dodec, that's 12. And so there's 12 carbons here, okay? Uh, and then that sulfate group, and then that sodium ion right here. So that's, that is a detergent. And it's amphipathic because we have this nonpolar portion here, this nonpolar tail, and then we have this polar head group. And when, it's very similar to a fatty acid. Okay, fatty acids are just, they have that long polar, that, in fact, it basically is a fatty acid, except that um, it's not a carboxylic acid, it's a sulfuric acid up here. Um, the point is that there's a nonpolar portion and a polar portion, uh, and if you have these kind of like fatty acids, they kind of orient themselves into these little spherical micelles. Now, this is obviously not, I didn't draw this in a spherical way, uh, but it's, a, it's kind of like a slice. If, like I, I mentioned kind of imagining um, a protein before, like an orange slice, um, or like an orange rather than taking a slice of it. Um, if you have an orange, the peel is exposed to the outside and then the, the fruity part isn't. So with the micelle, it's kind of like that. When you have like fatty acids or like detergents like this, uh, the nonpolar portions kind of orient themselves towards being in the center and then the surface is just the polar polar groups. And so anything nonpolar will kind of just hang out here. Now, um, that's assuming, of course, that it's in an aqueous environment. Okay, so there's water all around. Now, how does this disrupt or mess up uh, a protein structure? Well, um, proteins, let's say that they're in, whoops. This protein, let's say it's in an aqueous environment like most proteins are. And then we add this micelle or this, this, this detergent. And so what will happen is that the detergents, maybe we don't add like a ton of it um, and they're all like in micelles. Um, but let's say we add some and uh, we have these these uh, portions kind of hanging out and they don't want to be out and about like this. They don't want to be in that hydrophilic space. So what they're going to do is they're going to find whatever they can that's nonpolar and just snag it and hang on to it. So you can imagine that if there's enough of these uh, um, detergent particles, they'll go through and dig into this protein and, and kind of rip it out from the inside out uh, so as to have these nonpolar portions interact with the nonpolar interior of this protein. So it'll kind of get ripped out and um, you will have these little um, detergent particles interacting with the nonpolar portions of this protein and maybe that'll just take it from looking like that the protein originally to making it look something like like this who knows exactly what it'll, it'll look like but the point is that its structure will be ruined and um, of course consequently its function here's a quick 3d visual of what's going on with sds so here's sds and we've got its nonpolar tail it wants to be on the interior of that protein in the hydrophobic space not out in the hydrophilic space so it's going to stab its way in as are the rest of these sds's um and uh their their hydrophobic tails are going to make their way into the interior notice though that the hydrophilic portion of the sds here remains on the exterior surface okay if we zoom in we can see those hydrophobic tails from the sds's are interacting with the interior of this protein, which is held together in large part by the hydrophobic interactions on the inside. So these hydrophobic tails basically disrupt the hydrophobic interactions on the interior of that protein and rip the protein apart from the inside out. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of the idea there with detergents is that they'll um, destroy those hydrophobic interactions and, and kind of unfold the protein, okay. Um, yeah, so SDS is an example. Also, a lot of uh, household cleaners are detergents, like, uh, I mean, and and that they're they're toxic. Um, one of the reasons they're toxic um, as detergents is that they can they can do this to proteins. Um, okay, so next up, heat. Okay, so heat pretty much disrupts or breaks hydrogen bonds. And so hydrogen bonds hold together secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. So all those can be ruined by uh, excessive amounts of heat. So here I've drawn um, a serine with its OH group side chain and then another serine here. 
I didn't draw the whole amino acid, but um, we can see here that there's a hydrogen bond that um, that is holding these guys together, right there. And if we add enough heat, the the um, the atoms, these molecules will vibrate, and they'll have a higher kinetic energy, and they'll move apart. And so what used that that hydrogen bond that used to be there between them um, will will be broken. Okay. And this is happens when we cook, right? If you cook an egg, you can actually see the color change. You can see it cook. Cooking um, cooking meat, for example. Also, if you have like a steak, for example, um, it starts off this really red, sort of squishy. Um, maybe squishy is not the best word, but when you grill a steak, for example, the consistency changes, the color changes, all these different things change. Um, and so the proteins are in it are being denatured. Okay. Also, um, Heat is used as a denaturing agent when it comes to sterilizing medical equipment, especially surgical supplies. Um, they uh, basically they just cook them in like these in these machines that that take them to a really 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 high temperature so as to kill any potentially infectious organisms um, on them. Okay. Uh, next up, um, hydrogen bond donors or acceptors. So. These are basically molecules that can participate. Well, molecules that can participate in hydrogen bonds can basically get in the way of existing hydrogen bonds and proteins, and they can end up destroying those hydrogen bonds. So again, we're talking about something that can disrupt hydrogen bonds. So uh, hydrogen bonds hold together secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. So all of those can be disrupted by molecules that can do this. Um, one prime example is urea. And urea uh, can hydrogen bond extensively because of its... Uh, Lone pairs on the oxygen up here that can be involved as hydrogen bond acceptors, and the hydrogens on these um, attached to the nitrogens here can act as H bond donors. So what can happen is they can kind of sneak their way in between existing hydrogen bonds. For example, again, I'm using the example of two serines hydrogen bonding here, um, and uh, there, of course, is the the hydrogen bond. So if you add urea to this um, situation here. Uh, it can kind of squeeze its way in there and um, end up hydrogen bonding here with this this serine and hydrogen bond here with this serine over here. Um, and so now we've got urea hydrogen bonding with with um, with these two serine groups. So the point is that this hydrogen bond that we began with um, has been destroyed and instead it's been replaced with an H bond here and an H bond here but we end up destroying the one that we originally had. And so that will, of course, have an impact on that protein structure, um, especially if it's to a, a great extent. Okay. So uh, next up, reducing agents. Okay, so reducing agents, they reduce or break disulfide bonds or disulfide bridges um, into separate thiol groups. And this, of course, can disrupt tertiary or quaternary structure because disulfide bridges can hold uh, tertiary or quaternary structure together. So here I have a disulfide bridge. I have the bond between these two sulfurs on these separate cysteines. Okay. Um, if I add a reducing agent, that'll split them apart and we'll have those two separate thiol groups. Um, that's, that's just... This is a thiol here, and this is a thiol here, but now they're separate, okay? Um, and so if I want to reform, um, if I want to reform a disulfide bridge, I can oxidize it. Now the issue is that, um, actually before I get into that, um, an example of a reducing agent is beta mercaptoethanol or 2 mercaptoethanol. Um, it'll destroy disulfide bridges like this, okay? And one issue is that you can reform disulfide bridges, but you won't necessarily re reform the same disulfide bonds that were already there. Uh, if you have a protein that has multiple disulfide bridges and you add a reducing agent and then you, you break all those disulfide bonds and you add an oxidizing agent, it may not fold right back into the perfect position um, because you might have different disulfide bridges forming between different cysteines. It won't necessarily be like cysteine two maybe was originally bound to cysteine 147, but then uh, when you break that, cysteine 2 might end up being um, um, t somewhere totally away from 147. If you reoxidize it, cysteine 2 might form a disulfide bridge with cysteine 38. Who knows? So here's a visual to explain what I just described. 
we've got insulin here and insulin has three disulfide bridges okay one right here one right here and one up here now if you add a reducing agent it's going to go through and destroy those disulfide bridges and it will subsequently denature the protein now if you afterwards add some sort of oxidizing agent you will allow disulfide bridges to reform however you don't know that you will necessarily reform um, this specific disulfide bridge between these two cysteines right you might not reform that you might not reform the one between these two or the one that was between these two and even if you manage to form those exact same pairs there's no telling how the rest of the molecule might be oriented so basically there's no way to undo the denaturation the idea is that um, it's not easy to just undo a denaturation like this. Okay, in fact, it's not just with with reducing agents; it's just denaturation of proteins in general. It's it's pretty much impossible to to undo. Um, okay, next up, um, uh, heavy metals. Okay, so heavy metals often exist as metal um, ions. Okay, and they are specifically cations, so they're positively charged. Um, and thus they disrupt electrostatic interactions. Okay, so that'll be tertiary and quaternary structure. They can also disrupt disulfide bonds because of their affinity um, for sulfur. Okay, again, that's tertiary or quaternary structure. Uh, so some examples of heavy metals are like lead, mercury, silver. Um, and so just to kind of use a similar example that we did last time. If we have a pH of 7.4 and we have aspartate and lysine next to each other, there's that attraction between them because of the opposite charges. But if you add in uh, a silver, that silver ion uh, being positively charged might wanna hang out with the negatively charged uh, aspartate and there's an attraction there. It'll disrupt the interaction that was there between that aspartate and lysine. So of course, if that happens to a great enough extent, that can really screw up the protein structure. Also, um, uh, heavy metals tend to have a really high attraction for for cysteines. Now here I've drawn it um, just uh, being attracted to a thiol group. Um, so we can see here this kind of displaces the hydrogen that's there. Um, and that hydrogen comes off as an ion. Um, but it can do the same thing with uh, two cysteines that are, are bound together in a disulfide bond. So heavy metals can disrupt electrostatic interactions and disulfide bridges and therefore tertiary and quaternary structure. So heavy metal poisoning is a thing, heavy metal toxicity you might hear it referred to. Um, uh, when you have, so there are some metals that exist in trace amounts in our bodies. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's very possible that the levels of those, uh, those heavy metals can get too high. And uh, depending on the metal, the symptoms will vary. Um, so I can't give like a one size fits all explanation for heavy metal poisoning, at least not here in this video. Um, but one of the treatments for a lot of different heavy metal poisonings is uh, chelation therapy. And chelation therapy is just the idea of adding chelating agents, which are just electron donating groups. Um, and given that metal ions are positively charged, um, they want, they, they react well with things that are negatively charged, AKA electrons. Um, so electron donating groups um, on these chelating agents um, will basically attack these metals, kind of take them off these proteins, and then um, when they bond together, um, that that uh, they form like this coordinate covalent complex, and that that um, can be safely excreted in the urine. Okay. Now, of course, that's a quick one size fits all answer. There's obviously a lot more to it than what I mentioned here, but uh, I figured I'd mention it here since it's to some extent relevant to what we're talking about. Anyway, I hope that video was helpful as far as denaturation goes. Thank you for watching.